it's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. And you are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hey, it's Ronsley. A lot has happened since volume one of The Psychology of Entrepreneurship. Well, um, since this. I've said to people, I dare you to be happy. I fucking dare you to run the risk, to take a chance on yourself, to do something that you've always wanted to do and run the risk of being happy. What makes you happy? After talking with Jason in Toronto in volume nine, I had to interview this dude, Michelle Falcon, who is someone that has tasted success through hard work. He, amongst other things, owns a portfolio of restaurants in the heart of Toronto with over 150 team members. One of those restaurants has four floors, but um, before that, he has a past. I worked for a nine-figure business in my early 20s and found three topics that I said, this is what I'm going to build my career from. And those three topics are company culture, customer experience, and employee engagement, and how that all works together to be able to build an admired organization that just so happens to be profitable, regardless of the industry. Uh, I gave myself to my career in my early 20s. I got promoted five times in five years in a very admired company called 1-800-GOT-JUNK. I left in my mid-20s to start an advisory agency. So companies would hire me to help them build strategies to strengthen the relationships that they had with their employees and their customers and improve their company culture, customer experience, and employee engagement, going back to those three topics. So those three topics are company culture, customer experience, and employee engagement. I think I would like to put this volume in perspective at the start. I interviewed Michelle Falcon to get inside the mind of a hiring specialist that focused on culture. See, at a certain point, every entrepreneur, artist, creator, or founder would require to build a team around themselves. But a few things stop some of us from hiring a team. Usually it's because we don't know how to make all the elements come together as a leader. Sometimes it's because of past experiences. And why culture? Well, who wants to go to a place that is not fun to work at? Also, working alone sometimes gets, well, lonely. I left the advisory world because I was lonely. You know, I was building other people's companies. And I just miss being part of a team again. That's why I didn't ever have any destiny to get into hospitality. Like my father had to file for bankruptcy because he had a restaurant when I was in the 10th grade. And it, similar to many other people, chewed him up and spat him right out. Spat my dad out and filed for bankruptcy. I I saw my dad cry for the first time. Like, I think I'm trying to build the business that he tried to. These days, Michel has his sights on a new goal, which is gigantic. And I don't know if it's public knowledge yet, but I'll ask him and I'll let you know if I have the permission at the end of the volume. But before all that, what were the milestones along the way? My first client ever was Ferguson Moving and Storage, a small moving company. Paid me like 1500 bucks to like create these training materials for their frontline employees. And it, it prob- I probably should have charged them 10,000, but at the point I was like, I'll take a check from anyone. Yeah. But that small, those small companies then turned into Verizon Wireless, a hundred billion dollar company, Alfa Romeo, Blue Cross Blue Shield, a multi-billion dollar insurance company. So at 26, I was working with executives of these billion dollar companies and truth be told, I didn't know how to write a proposal. And if I did, they were all grammatically incorrect. Like I'm not an academic. I just found topics that I gave myself to and the timing was right. Uh, Today, uh, in two years, we've 
we, meaning my business partners and I, have grown a hospitality company in Toronto. And in two years, we've gone from zero employees and zero dollars in revenue to $15 million a year in revenue and 150 employees. And that growth isn't stopping anytime soon. Crazy growth, right? Which, by the way, he puts down to those three topics. Company culture, customer experience, and employee engagement. I am always intrigued about what makes us tick as entrepreneurs. What makes us work? Why do we do what we do? What motivates us to get punched in the face and get up the next morning to just move forward? I was bullied a lot as a kid. I didn't actually fit into any group. I was a geek that played sport and vice versa, the captain of the debate and elocution teams that was on the badminton, table tennis, basketball and other teams. I suppose I did all that to probably fit in somewhere, maybe. There was a lot of shame in my childhood. And while I was thinking about all this, Michelle made me feel like I wasn't alone. As a kid, I was very, like, sat in my room, like, crying, like, oh, and I, you know, why wouldn't you just go tell your parents? I don't know. Like, I grew up in a South American household. My dad's a drill sergeant. Right? Like, I remember when I was, I must have been six or seven, my dad and my uncle, uh, sorry, my older cousin Hugo um, were having drinks, and I was just there, kind of, like, walking around the house. And then my dad, probably a little inebriated, was like, uh, Michelle, when you have a family and somebody tries to break into your house, what do you do? I was like, uh, call 911. Mm. And he's like, no, you take care of, you take a bat and you take care of it. That was how I was raised. Right. Okay. Yeah. So brawn, right? Um, so no, I didn't feel comfortable telling my parents. And my mom's the polar opposite. She's an angel on earth, right? But, um, yeah, it, it, it sucked, man. Like, yeah. and, you know, I don't care what anybody says. Everyone is bullied in one way or another. Whether it's being called dumb or physical bullying or, you know, being undermined by... Like, I remember my... Uh, Patricia Clay, she was my sixth grade teacher, called me dumb. Dude, like, <laughs> what on earth? And, like, that's a form of bullying. Of course. So, you know, why do I like this, like, pain? It's just all I've ever known, I guess. My job is sometimes the hardest but most fulfilling of roles because I ask questions whose answers make the conversation uncomfortable. I get to hear things that make me feel. And also, my guest gets to hear things that make them feel. Sometimes it's just interesting to notice what makes us the people we are. Do you remember when Michelle said, My father f had to file for bankruptcy because he had a restaurant when I was in the 10th grade. And it, similar to many other people, chewed him up and spat him right out. I wanted to know what made this restaurant idea or these restaurants ideas different and why was it successful this time around? The way that I'm building my business is different than most hospitality companies. Most hospitality companies, most restaurants and bars are product centric. I'm trying to be people centric. The product is an outcome of being people centric. Nike isn't a product company. They're a purpose-driven company, which is why they stand behind social injustices like the Colin Kaepernick. For those of you listening that haven't seen the Nike ad, here is the audio. If people say your dreams are crazy, if they laugh at what you think you can do, good. Because calling a dream crazy is not an insult. It's a compliment. Don't try to be the fastest in your school. Be the fastest ever. Don't believe you have to be like anybody to be somebody. Don't become the best basketball player on the planet. Be bigger than basketball. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. If you have only one hand, don't just watch football, play. And if you're a girl from Compton, become the greatest athlete ever. Yeah, that's more like it. 
So don't ask if your dreams are crazy. Ask if they're crazy enough. Be bigger. Believe in more. What is your purpose? Sorry, Michelle, I interrupted you. You were saying... Serena Williams's Nike ad that just came out. Did they talk about shoes ever? They don't, that's a byproduct of their purpose. And that's what I'm trying to do as well too. I'm bringing this people first culture philosophy. And I, this morning I hosted a four hour workshop for a dental practice. And when I'm talking to them, I'm like, guys, you don't extract teeth, right? You don't do cosmetic dentistry. That's just an outcome of what your purpose is. And that's what we have to figure out is what is the purpose of the company? And I'm paraphrasing, but um, what they settled on and are refining is like making people feel beautiful. How they do that is extracting teeth, is cosmetic dentistry, whitening and all that such, right? So for me, it's like entrepreneurship is just doing something the way that you want to do it and regardless of the industry uh, and what that what history going back to history has dictated how it should be done like if anything i'm like and call me like a dentist the menace but I'm like this ain't right i'm gonna do it this way because at the end of the day you're just managing human behavior regardless of the business what is in a niche the gluten-free products market will be worth more than $6.8 million by the end of 2019. You know, I've done all these great things for charity along the way. And yes, let me tell you this about all that I did for charity in the past. It was for me to make me look good. And it came with, with uh, different contingencies on them. And I looked for something back. And I always offended people, including I was offended by people, including my own family who I made it out. Oh, I bought my mom a house and a car. Yes, I bought it for her because I loved her and I wanted her to have. But I also wanted to have that stigma, right? I wanted my brothers and sisters who all went to the Ivy Leagues to say he was right. He didn't have to study as hard as us. He didn't go to Harvard and he has way more success and he's way more happy and successful than mine. And it was BS. Now, you know, I, my biggest joy is my sibling's success. That was David Meltzer from Volume 5. Why do we do what we do? Coming up further in this volume, I asked Michelle to break down his hiring process and how he picks people to be part of the journey he's on. I am so glad I asked him that because he kept talking about one of his team members called Riley, who has grown within his organization. And then he defines success like this. What Michelle Falcon considers success, my definition of success is when Riley messages me and says, I got the job with XYZ Biotech Company. That is my definition of success in my career. You know, with hospitality, if it spat me out, like it spat my father out, maybe I didn't succeed, but if I so try again, or if I try another industry, I think it increases the likelihood that I will be successful for the long term. It goes back to the short term, long term thing. I'm not trying to win in the short term with everything that I do. Because, you know, I, I would like to believe that I, I have decades ahead of me to, to win in my personal and professional life. So the talk that I give myself is like, you're going to lose. That serpent guy kicked my ass. <laughs> but I now know that I'm going to kick Jason Gainyard's ass June 21st. <laughs> There's got to be some context around that later. So I interviewed Michelle in March in Toronto. This was obviously before the fight with Jason Gaynard. And in the build up to that fight, to give you an idea of what kept coming up in my Facebook news feed, there was a video that started like this. On June 21st, two men are coming together to fight for honor, respect, and glory. This is going to be the fight of the century. Move over McGregor, move over Mayweather. We've got Michelle Falcon and Jason Gaynard going to be touching gloves on June 21st to see who's a real pound for pound king of the ring. Hold on a second. You look hungry. 
Ah, you're fine. <laughs> Dude. Eat up, because you're going to need the protein. See, so he's, he's taking my jokes. I walked in here with a Happy Meal for Michelle, because I know he'd he be getting hungry. He's cutting, cutting weight. This is, the, that this is the problem. You didn't execute, that similar to cute. how you're not going to execute on June 21st. He's been practicing. Okay, so is, let's get this started, this guys. Let's get this started, guys. Michelle, <laughs> on New Year's, you said Delicious. one of your goals is to fight anybody in an amateur round. Why Jason, when you could have fought anybody else? I'm not going to tell you who won. But Jason did. <laughs> anyway, in all seriousness, sometimes there are clues all around us and we choose not to see them. Sometimes we forget that, just like everyone else, we have experiences that have built us. I don't want to sound Gary Vaynerchuk like, but like failing in is, I, I like it. I don't advocate it. Not like fail, 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 but like, again, I don't want to sound cliche, but nothing's really come easy for me. Like I, I didn't grow up wealthy. I grew up in a lower middle class and I would never say that in front of my parents because I think it would, it would hurt their feelings, but that's the truth. I, my mom worked a lot. My dad worked a lot. I did, do you know how painful it is to learn, teach yourself how to ride a bike? As a kid, <laughs> like oh, that's that. Like I taught myself how to ice skate by myself. I taught myself how to ride a bike by myself. I taught myself how to play hockey by myself. Like it's all I've ever known. Nobody in my family really are entrepreneurs. My dad took a shot at it, but like there's no real entrepreneurship in my family. My grandfather was a fish market, but it was like a small little fish market. I just like having the mentality of like, if it's been done before, why can't I do it? My friend Brent Hogarth taught me this and it's just, I am. And it's just something that I say to myself, just like, I am going to do this. I am going to give a great speech. I am going to figure this out. And it's just something that I'm constantly uh, kind of reaffirming to myself. But um, I don't know, just like, has, like, I don't feel like anything has really been given to me in, like on a platter, nor would I accept it. Hard work, persistence, constant learning. Probably the bits that we know we need, but the bits that are hard to execute or implement, like differentiation or niching. How do you differentiate a restaurant? Everybody has to eat, right? Well, everybody has to eat, yes, but not everybody has to eat a $60 steak or order a $200 bottle of wine. Uh, why I love what I do on the customer side of things is being able to create experiences where price is secondary for the customer. We are not the cheapest in the marketplace. We're not even close to being the cheapest, uh, nor do I ever want to get to a place where we are. That's just not my world. I love building experiences both for customers and employees that will have them thinking price and salary is secondary. Now on the salary side, I have team members that could be hired by other hospitality companies and be paid more, but they're choosing to leave 10% on the table because they know our culture is great. We've created what I call a culture of learning where look, come work with us. If you so happen to want to grow your career in hospitality, let us grow that with you. If you're here, a server, but one day you want to be the director of learning and development, let's get you there. When we come back, a step-by-step -step set of instructions of how Michelle and his partners hired all their team members. The objective of this audio documentary is to bring together entrepreneurs and creatives who share similar values in a place where conversations can be had without judgment. A place where our listeners can give us constructive feedback to improve the show with topic and guest recommendations. For access to this space, go to mustamplify.com slash poe and click the button. 
my father is very conservative politically. And so if we talk, if we look, watch the exact same news conference, he will say, did you see how XYZ reinforces what I already believe? And I myself am independent. I don't like either side, but I'm very much not extreme right. So I'll say, but what what about about ABC? ABC? I I saw those things that reinforce my belief. And so we can literally have the exact same experience and take it completely different ways. And that's because of confirmation bias. That was Laura Peterson in volume 10. What are we doing to confirm our biases of the world around us? Before the break, we covered motives, childhood memories and definitions for success. Now, for a question I get asked a lot. Ronsley, what is the ROI of having a podcast? So, (laughs) I wanted to ask Michelle that, what is the ROI on doing so much work when it comes to employee engagement? Short-term and long-term thinking. I don't work well with people that are short-term thinkers. Uh, whether it's on my management team, when we're creating experiences for our customers or employees, I don't want to always be asking what is the ROI of doing this for our customers or employees because sometimes creating great experiences for people, whether it's in your personal life or your professional life, takes a while for the ROI to appear on your balance sheet or on your P&L. On the employee side as well too is, look, we're trying to build something that the industry hasn't seen before and so far, so good. If I have a team member hand in hat every day, like I want this section because I want, I should get this section because I want more tips. That's just poisonous to our culture. Like, look, you're going to get sorted out. I guarantee you. And this sometimes happens where we see, you know, morale go down a little bit. Um, because in the month of January and February, hospitality kind of takes a dip because people start getting their credit card statements from the holidays, right? So it's kind of ghost town-ish. So our servers are like, oh, I'm not making enough money. Like, where is that thought come the spring and the summer? At the end of the year, you're going to net out to make as much as you want. But I can't tolerate that hand in hat, right? Like, so to answer your question directly, no, those people typically don't have a place in our business. And what I will coach our management team to say, look, if you've identified an individual like that, who's great on the skill set side, but isn't going to fit culturally, culturally, tell them that this respectfully, that this isn't the place for you. Go apply at Jacobs or go to this place. They'll have you. We'll even give you a recommendation. Our business isn't meant for everyone, both on the employee or the customer side. Are you clear on who your customers and employees are? Or, more importantly, who they are not. I suppose knowing that is step one before you hire. And I also suppose that because Michelle is so clear on who he doesn't want, he has made his hiring process extraordinarily rigorous. The way that we hire is extraordinarily rigorous. It's a gauntlet of an interview process. It's a six step process to identify culture fit before skill set. I do not care. If you can cook the best steak in the city, or if you know how to create the best cocktail in the city of Toronto, I don't care if you're not a culture fit. So we're culture focused first. And then eventually I care if you know how to cook a steak, but not until I've said this person is a culture fit. Phone interview, Uh Uh, a couple things I'm listening for here. How do they answer their phone? What does their voicemail sound like? If they can't represent themselves well as an individual, what's the likelihood that they're gonna be able to represent the brand well? Okay, so I pick up on that. Uh, I pick up on enthusiasm on the in, in, on the call. Is it like, sorry, uh, who's calling? Oh, I applied to 20 different places. What do you do? Like, not interested, okay? Yeah. Uh, the next is something called predictive index. It's a behavioral assessment that will tell us uh, what this individual um, will be like in the workplace, what makes them tick, what ticks them off, who should they potentially be uh, matched with as their manager. Then comes the predictive index. So it's an assessment we send to them immediately after the phone interview. Then it takes them no more than seven minutes to complete and it's going to spit out a report. We're going to evaluate that report. And based on the the position that we're hiring for, we'll look at the assessment and be like, should we bring them into an in-person interview? 
Right. If that's yes, the next interview is uh, related to culture and culture only. We'll ask two questions per core value that we have, a sum of 10 questions. And the only thing we're thinking about is this person going to fit. I, at this point, I don't care about what they've done in the past because I'm more concerned of, on how they're going to impact the future within our company. I don't allow our managers to bring resumes to this interview, the culture interview, because I don't want them to gravitate toward their past successes. All I want them to know is what is their first name and what are they applying for and go ask those culture questions. According to 2019 statistics on hiring, 52% of talent acquisition leaders say that the most difficult part of their job is to screen candidates from a large applicant pool. Um, before you go on, favorite interview question? Uh, what is the temperature of the sun? I've asked this question for, for years and I, I, I haven't memorized the answer because the answer is so irrelevant. Um, if you had applied for a bartender position, I asked you that question, you're probably going to answer in one of uh, one way, most likely. Most people are like, uh, I don't know, hot? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, on with the interview. Um, but if the candidate says, I don't know, but I'm going to find out for you. Okay, great. Move on to the next question. And then an hour after the interview, I get an email. Say, hey, Michelle, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to interview with the company. By the way, the answer to your question is X. I hope to hear back from you. I would highly consider hiring that individual because that is exactly how they're going to behave when their customers inevitably ask them a question they don't answer, have the answer to. Fourth step is skill set. Now I care if you know how to cook a steak. Uh, the fifth step is the assignment. So let's say we're hiring a marketer for a hospitality company. I'll give them an assignment that takes them about four to eight hours to complete. Uh, I'll send it to them Friday at about 2 p.m. and say, I would like you to have this assignment back to me Monday by 10 a.m. And the reason I've strategically asked them to do it Friday is because I want to see who's willing to give up their weekend for their career. Mm. This isn't for everyone. I've had some people, some companies say, I don't like that because I want our employees to have weekends off. Sure. Work-life balance. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm in hospitality. Yeah. We're busy as Saturdays and Sundays yeah. and the weekends. Yeah. So it makes sense for me. But there's also uh, cultures that are built um, on working hard, working long hours. And look, we can debate this, whether that's right or wrong. If you want to run your company this way, having people work 60, 70 hours, let that go ahead. They're going to sign up for it. Yeah. Um, so now we're at the assignment um, and you would see, be interesting to see because I'm trying to filter people out. I want to see how many people, 50% of candidates will drop off right. at the assignment because they're not willing to put in the work. Second. All right. So if you're not willing to put in the work for yourself, you think you're going to give yourself to my company? No. Uh, and then is um, the sign off slash celebration. So the sign off is two people sign off on every candidate. You're saying yes. Okay. Prove me wrong. And then the celeb celebratory part. One of our core values is celebration as an organization. So if we're going to celebrate our guests, we have to celebrate each other so that they know what it feels like. Very, very rigorous. But you can understand why. If someone is going out of their way to spend that kind of money in an establishment, you are going to make sure that the right people make their night special. So... If you extrapolated what Michelle is saying, rather than being a place you can just buy food and drink at, you create experiences. If you extrapolated that out for your business, what would that look like? All these high standards, I suppose, comes with a level of responsibility. I know one way to lead, and that's what makes sense for me. That's it. And my role within the company is to be that flag bearer for these things. I will never be excused from it, nor do I ever want to be excused from these things. But when it comes to our roles as leaders within companies, just do what makes sense for you. Because if you don't, people are going to sniff that out and be like, that's not authenticity. He's trying too hard. <laughs> and I think every organization needs that flag bearer, that benevolent, that servant leader. Our roles as leaders made me think about a Jimmy Kimmel episode where he did this. 
By the way, when Obama went on TV to announce that they'd killed bin Laden, he spoke for nine and a half minutes. Trump yesterday did 48 minutes on this. And for further comparison, we thought it might be fun to mash up Trump's speech about al-Baghdadi with Obama's about bin Laden. And we were right, it was. The United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden. Abu Bakar al-Baghdadi is dead. The United States launched a targeted operation against that compound. They did a lot of shooting and they did a lot of blasting, even not going through the front door. You know, you think you go through the door. If you're a normal person, you say, knock, knock, may I come in? After a firefight, they killed Osama bin Laden and took custody of his body. He died like a dog. I think it would be awesome to watch the whole clip online. It is only a couple of minutes long and funny as hell. Leadership looks different to different people. But Michelle, the question that has been on my mind ever since you started talking about team was, what if you have a team member that comes to you saying that they feel like they can't succeed with these levels of expectation? What would you do? Uh, I would first ask them, you know, how have you come to this conclusion? Let's unpack that because perhaps I haven't led you properly to be able to succeed. Uh, more often than not, um, people don't fail processes do. So maybe I shouldn't have hired you. Maybe I didn't train you well enough, but it's not cut out for everybody. But if we unpack it and we realize, you know what? You aren't necessarily that benevolent and servant leader, but you still have your strengths. Everyone has to be a culture fit in our company, but some people are more flag bearers than others. Some people should stay within the same company. They're just in the wrong role. So identify, are they in the right role for them to succeed? If not, then get them there. And then if you try to get them there and they still fail, then they're probably not suited for the company. And I would say, look, go work at Jacob's Steakhouse. Mm. Or go over there. They'll have you. And, and I'll facilitate that. Um, but if somebody says I'm not cut out for it, I'll, I'll do kind of a self audit being like, have we failed him or her? More often than not, it's yes. With this level of detail, I kept thinking, does Michelle do everything? Also, I'm very aware that some of the biggest celebrities that come into Toronto will make their way into his establishments. Does he care that not many people know that he's one of the founders? How does he make it all come together? I don't even know how to turn the lights on in my buildings. That's not why I'm there. But if Riley is gone for a month, our customers will know. They'll eventually ask, where's Riley? If I'm gone for a month, nobody knows who the hell I am. So who's more important then? Sure, I have my place. I contribute and I would like to think that our businesses have grown because of my involvement. But the day to day, and I advocate this to leaders of businesses all the time, like you aren't the person that should be building all the strategic initiatives and operational improvement plans within your business. When's the last time you spoke to a customer? Like actually, my hostesses tonight will speak to more customers in one night than I will in an entire month. So with, with that being said, like, why would all the ideas come from me? That doesn't make sense. Richard Branson was uh, famous for dressing up in drag and serving his, his guests, right? Getting in the trenches as well, too. That's benevolence. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Coming up on the psychology of entrepreneurship and you are good enough, and this business issue isn't tied to your worth. I may not have the clout or the stature or the significance of other people that will be at MMT, but I really feel like I can provide value. And I think in the entrepreneurial community more generally is they tend to pull back a little bit and sort of isolate themselves if they feel that insecurity. We all have that dialogue, we all have that voice. And I would say around that point, that's I think when I started to become aware that I really didn't I, I, I probably had a lot of self-hatred. I'm not wearing my I'm not worthy glasses anymore. 
I interviewed Michelle because he is the best-selling author of People First Culture, building a lasting business by shifting your focus from profits to people. He has built an eight-figure business with 150 employees in the highly competitive industry of hospitality. Here is a list of some of the companies that deal with Michelle. Toyota, Verizon, Lush, Alfa Romeo, Zillow, EA Sports, to name a few. He's not just an author, he's an operator and practitioner. He has been included in publications like Inc., Entrepreneur, Forbes, and Time. He specializes in company culture, customer experience, and employee engagement. He is a fighter, international sought-after speaker, and friend. Psychology of Entrepreneurship This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Editing and sound design by Kelly Bonniman and Joel Thomas. Voiceover by Sonia Stone. Fact voiceover by Kelly Bonniman. Guest research and content by Claire Gould. Project managed by Shannon Morrison. Produced and hosted by me, Ron Slivas. For more episodes and where to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Hey, it's Kaylee from Must Amplify. I'm the sound engineer for this volume of Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I'm a part of the team that made this production come alive. Our team consists of members from all around the globe, with our headquarters based in West End, Brisbane, Australia, the land of the drop bear. For more about the cool stuff that we're up to and to work out of our studios, head to mustamplify.com. So I asked Michelle whether I could share the news and on the 13th of October, he shared this with a close group of friends. I quote, When I came to Toronto from Vancouver in 2016, my partners and I have created cool ventures, restaurants, bars that challenged all of us. And I can honestly say that no consulting engagement, which is what I did before hospitality, was as difficult as what we've built. But now it's time for new challenges. And in 2020, I'm looking at my last project in my career. So what's next? Well, Michelle is looking to build the Chipotle for Peruvian food. So in his words, he says, similar to how Howard Schultz popularized coffee in North America or how Steve Ellis marketed Mexican food with Chipotle. I want to do the same for Peruvian food. I'm venturing into quick service restaurants. I'm Peruvian and our cuisine hasn't scaled globally. So I am looking forward to the new challenge and I can't wait to get punched in the face while being challenged at this new venture.